I am Colin Gray. I'm a TIPCO data scientist, and we're here today for another session with um, the team TIPCO Silicon Valley Bank uh, professional cyclists. And it's great that we've got Kristen joining us today. And um, thanks a lot for for giving your time after what's been quite a hectic start to the season. Uh, and it looked like you've had some really great results. And you know, last time. I got to speak to Lauren and we're talking about the Tour of Flanders at the end of last season and that was great and, and there was a lot of strategy and interest and data we went through there. Um, so just introduce yourself to the, the fans who are, are watching and tell us a little bit about how you, you got into the team and in your career so far. Yes, and thank you so much for having me join as well. Um, so I've been on Team Typical Silicon Bank since 2020. And because of COVID, we actually didn't, um, I didn't end up racing until September of 2020. So I went to Europe for the fall classics, which were the spring classics that had been postponed till the fall. And I raced Tour de Flanders for the first time um, during that fall block. And then I went back this spring in 2021 and raced it again in early April. So this is my second Tour de Flanders that we're gonna be debriefing today. Yeah, and, and so that first year, um was that a really good kind of way to build up the experience you know if you've only had a couple of years you know how different is it going back to a course for the second time if you've got a lot more confidence a lot more knowledge um, and does that change how you approach the race definitely a lot more confidence and, and knowledge of the course I think the first time I was weighing over my head you know they say ignorance is bliss yeah. and I kind of went into the race not knowing what to expect and so um you know there were times I would hit a cobbled climb and I'd be like oh another cobbled climb but I didn't I wasn't yeah. expecting it because I, I didn't really know what was there um and so this year I made uh you know a big effort to recon the course to memorize all the climbs to know which ones were cobbled how long they were and, um, you know, it just gives it a huge confidence boost, but it also makes me much more aware of what's happening during the race um, for other teams, but also so that our team can be more strategic during the race. You know, if we know when there's a critical section coming up, we know we need to be towards the front. And so I think this year we really took a lot of that strategy and, and, and played well with it. Um, and definitely, you know, having more experience on the course made a big difference. So what I've got up here is the, the TIBCO Spotfire dashboard and what, what we've been lucky enough is to get a lot of the data from the TIBCO um, Silicon Valley team um, from all the races they've done and load it up. So we've added in the latest data from the Tour of Flanders in 2021, um, but anyone can visit this dashboard and look to this analysis that we're about to do today. Um, you can click on any of the riders from the team that we've got data for here, and it'll, it'll show you the, their race history. And you can even look down all the races that we've loaded up data. So you can go see we've got back during the season, 2020, the Tour de Flanders we went through last time with Lauren. And of course, today's topic, uh, Tour of Flanders 2021 with Kristen. So if I just click on this, this button here, it will take us into the race analysis that we've got here. And just to explain to people what we're looking at, we've got the, the imagery and the mapping of where the riders actually were on the course. And we've got a distribution of the power outputs. The power you know, is one of the key attributes that you look at for the cycling stats. We've got things like heart rate. And here we've got the altitude of the, rate, uh, the actual track, as well as each individual rider's power profile. And one thing to note that this power profile is an average over distance so it's to smooth it out and it makes it better for analysis but for instance you know Kristen we can see your power profile here in blue um, from the course so I've picked a few points of interest on the course that I want to sort of ask you about you know how the team strategy was played out and how you were racing there and um, one of the first things we know we saw was in a difference to last year was if we just go to sort of quite early in the race and we look at um, the positions as on the map here, you can see each rider is very close together. And, and if you go forward throughout time in the race, because I can just move into different race times, you see you're really sticking together as a pack there. Um, but Nina tends to be leading. Is that something you plan and discuss before the race gets started? You know, you have a long term strategy or how much is reacting to the riders around you um, at that moment? Mm -hmm. It's definitely a combination of both. So we go into every race with a team strategy, uh, different riders have different roles. And then 
depending on all the variables that can happen during the race, there's also some that then unfolds dynamically as the race goes on. So in this case, uh, Nina was um, in charge of, you know, making sure that she stayed towards the front, that we stayed towards the front, and that she was giving lead outs into critical sections. And so by being towards the front, she was more in the wind, she had to fight her way to the front. And that's why her power output was much higher. Um, and then also she was giving lead outs to the team going into really critical sections, whether that was a cobbled section or a climb or a narrow descent. And so she really put a lot more work in, in the beginning half of the race to make sure that the rest of us were there towards the end. And um, that's all part of the team strategy. So yeah, she did a really good job in, in executing that role. So that's, that's interesting. And um, one of the one of the other things I noticed as well, um, and a similar thing actually happened last year was when we we're looking through the data and you can see how the power profile is changing, like you say, Nina's, you know, her power output was generally higher. Um, but one stage um, into the race, when you're all still together as a pack, suddenly your power um, profile drops. Mm -hmm. So if I just zoom into that point, and what I noticed from the GPS, um, and I was assuming that the GPS data is accurate, is you've also dropped back from the pack. And I was wondering mm -hmm. what's happened here, because we see this power output just completely stop. Um, could you say what happened at that point? Yes, so I had to do a bike change. And so um, when that happens, I raise my hand, I pull over to the side of the road and the peloton continues. And so um, I'd gotten kind of caught on the side of the road and, and fell over. And um, so the rest of the pack, so my teammates all went with the peloton and then I had to stay back and wait for the team car to catch up. And so my car went, um, so it slowed down as I slowed down to move over to the side of the road. Um, and then you'll notice later I kind of catch back on once I get my um, new bike from the team car. And so yeah. that's what was happening there was the bike change and the rest of the team was, was staying with the Peloton moving forward. So that's really interesting because I, I was fascinated by the fact, because like you say, if I just go a couple of, just move, click in here, I can move through the race time. I'm just moving a minute or two ahead and you actually mm -hmm. see you're already back with the pack. That's kind of I was wondering how on earth you did the bike change so quickly to then be able to catch <laughs> up to the pack and, and join the race again effectively. Yeah, well, fortunately, it was a pretty wide road. And so um, the cars were there. So I was able to weave through some of the cars to get back. So you kind of right. hop on the back of a car and, then, you know, and, and that's a lot harder in a really narrow road. Um, it was also a pretty flat section. And so I um, was able to, again, ride the draft a lot. The draft made a much bigger difference. Um, and then the third thing is that um, my my bike change was pretty fast. And so um, our mechanic and our team did a really good job of making the, the bike change happen really quickly for me. And so I, you know, basically they, they pulled up, they took my bike, they gave me my bike, I got my computer and I was off to the races. And so um, that's, you know, another really important part of when you get a mechanical is just having a mechanic and a team that can do that bike change really quickly. So um, yeah. I would say it's never lucky to, to get a mechanical, but if I were to get a mechanical <laughs> at any point in the race, that was a better spot than others to get a mechanical. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, because yeah, that is that for me. That was really interesting because you know we also work with you know the Mercedes Tronus F Formula One team, and obviously it's a completely different type of sport. But in terms of having issues with the car and come and getting it changed and and the, the reacting to that and how you can survive and get back out and, and join the race, it's actually quite interesting because a lot of the things you're saying are quite similar to the the, the challenges they face as well. Um, so what I what I noticed as well is then just like you were saying like you get back into the race so not not much uh, further into the time you know uh, a certain amount of kilometers later maybe 10 or 15 kilometers I noticed that you're actually already back and what I've done here is for for the people watching I will, we were looking at of course the power profiles um, mm -hmm. but because your power rating has gone as you see because of your bike change so what I've done here is we've actually changed it to use the speed which is uh, some of the data we still have coming off uh, your race but you can really see here you're now actually leading the pack uh, not long after uh, when you did your bike change and you can see that your speed was slightly above on average the, the rest of the team which looks like that's where you were catching up and now you're mm -hmm. actually taking the lead there mm -hmm. was that was is, was that timing as well for you planning sort of for the end sprint was that part of the strategy and it was just uh, you know, it was just coincidence that you had your bike change quite near that 
um, or did that bike change change your strategy at that point to sort of push into the end and getting that top 10 finish? No, so the bike change didn't change the team strategy. Um, I think what happened was, so the bike change happened, I had to definitely pick up my speed to catch back up to the Peloton. And so that was one reason why my speed was higher than the rest of the team was just, I, I had to catch back yeah. on. Um, and then, you know, I was trying to, um, you know, part of the team strategy was to make sure that we had um, me or Lauren or Sarah or, you know, other riders in our team uh, make it to the finish. And so part of that was making sure that we were in the front going into really critical sections. And so um, that meant that before all the hill climbs, we had to be part of the lead outs that other teams were doing, that our team was doing. And we had to make sure that, you know, on the hill climbs, if someone attacked, that we were following. And so um, if you look at the, the speed, um, you'll see that it's slightly higher on the hill climb. And so that was me trying to kind of make sure I move towards the front on the hill, slightly yeah. faster, you know, on the descent, um, which meant that I was more towards the front on the descent. I wasn't getting blocked by the people in front of me. And then throughout the race, it kind of continued just because I made a very concerted effort to stay towards the front, because as you move towards the end of the race, that's when a lot of breakaways happen and attempted breaks. And so if a team attacks, you want to make sure that you can cover their move. And so you know, in the beginning, we had, you know, really making sure that we were there for the critical sections. And then towards mm -hmm. the end, it's basically up to the riders, you know, you have to be to the front or else, or else you might, you know, if the pack splits and you're not part of that split, then there's nothing the teammate can do to help you. And so for me, I think my speed really picked up um, because I was wanting to do everything I could to just make sure that I was staying towards the front of the pack. Yeah, and you can, you can really, yeah. Yeah, and you can really see that um, because you, you're consistently the, this rolling average of the speed is higher and you can see how it's changing versus the altitude. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying that, you know, talking about keeping it up, I was just flicking through the times and you can see, you know, yourself there sort of ahead of the rest of the team, but obviously covering, mm -hmm. I guess, other racers and other teams that we can't see here. And that mm -hmm. continues throughout, um, you know, till the end of the race. And then if we actually jump to the end, you know, when you, when you got that amazing top 10 finish, you can see, you know, quite a difference in the in the GPS trace. Um, here you're you're really pushing out. And I noticed, you know, in the last sort of here after this um, ascent, and then it's particularly at the end, your speed is really ramping up here versus um, you know, the other racers in the team. Um mm -hmm. is you know, can you talk us a little bit about through that end, the effort, you know, the decision to push at that point, um, yep. you know, and, and the, what, what the rest of the team are doing there. Yes, so there's actually, um, on the Canaryberg is one of the climbs and the pack actually split on the Canaryberg. And so what had happened is and someone from another team had kind of had a little bit of a pile up on the Canaryberg. And so I was um, in the front of that pile up. And so I was able to continue on with the Peloton and many of our teammates were behind that. And so they got stuck behind it on the climb. And so their speed slowed down for a little bit. And then they got caught in the second group. And um, just by nature of the, the racers that tend to ride towards the front, um, the front pack was going at a faster speed for the rest of the race than the, the pack that had kind of gotten stuck behind that crash and, and pile up. And so even though it was, um, you know, none of our riders were, were caught in the pile up, they were caught behind it. And it was a very narrow road. And so unfortunately for the rest of the race, that put me in a position where I was, you know, kind of isolated out front without teammates. And, and much of my teammates were not um, in a position that they had wanted to be in because they had been kind of stuck in, and put in this second group, not because they couldn't climb fast, but because they were stuck behind, you know, this pileup that happened. And so for the rest of the race, I was in, um, probably a, a slightly faster group going towards the finish um and then also at that point the selection had been made and the front group was really determined to make sure it stuck and most people who had you know who were in the second group had teammates that had that were in the front group and so they were less incentivized to bring it back together and so that was kind of a tactical thing that had happened um you know it was a this is an example of something that just unfolded dynamically during the race. Um, the pileup on the Canaryberg was unexpected. We had to change our plans. We were hoping to have more people together at the end of the race towards the front, um, but things happen. It didn't happen. So um, I kind of had to make do with, with what I had and, and my teammates tried to catch up, um, but you know, with the, the size and strength of the peloton up front, it was just really hard for them to do so. Um, 
And so I think, you know, that's where you see that gap happening. It was, it was after that pile up on the Canary Berg where I right. was able to make the front split and, and they unfortunately were not. That's, I guess, where what you were talking about right at the start, all that prep, you know, all that knowledge being in your the second year and, and speaking to your teammates, did that really help having that extra analysis and, and knowledge because you your team got stuck in that um, sort of pile up before? Definitely. You know, I learned for, for me um, that it's really important to make sure that I'm towards the front of the peloton. I don't want to be yeah. at the front, but I want to be towards the front. And yeah. particularly because these roads are really, really narrow. And so if you're not in the front, it's really hard to move up on a lot of these really narrow roads. And so what happens is all of the teams, all of the experienced teams kind of know this. And so they give really fast lead outs into those really narrow roads. So the Canary Bird was an example of a really fast lead out going into the climb. And um, sometimes it can be really hard to move to the front during those fast lead outs, even if you want to. Um, and so I was lucky in that I was able to kind of catch on a, a fast train and, and, and make my way to the front. Um, but for me, just the way that I like to race is to be as close to the front as possible not necessarily because, um, you know, A, because I can watch what's happening in the race, but B, because there can always be crashes in front of you that you can't control. And when you're stuck yeah. behind them, it really impacts you. So one example yeah. actually was towards the end of the race, um, which we might get to in a, in a moment. Um, so uh, on the Claremont, there was a small mechanical, um, the girl in front of me had a, a, a small mechanical and I got caught behind her. And that was when the, the split happened where the front group of eight went off on the Claremont and I was kind of stuck in the, the second group at that point, the chase group. And right. so I didn't make that front split of eight. And that was a, an example where going into the Claremont, had I been towards the front, which I wasn't, I would have been in front of that girl with the mechanical and, and you know, potentially I likely would have made that front split of eight. And so that just goes to show the importance of positioning. Um, and positioning really requires a lot of teamwork because you need teammates to, you know, help move you through the peloton as a unit. It's a lot easier to do it as a group than it is as an individual. I really appreciate you sharing all that. It's uh, some really great insights and great to see the story of the race and match it to the data we've got here from, from your race and your, your teammates. Um, mm -hmm. Finish by saying uh, thank you very much for talking us through this. Um, that was a great session. I really appreciate your time and good luck to you and all the team for, for the races coming up. Thank you. And thanks for doing the dashboard. It's really helpful for us to be able to look back at a race and figure out what went well, what went wrong, you know, where we executed strategy and didn't. And I think having more data like this is just only going to help us, you know, data is power. And then when we have it, we can perform better. So we'll take this with us into the, the future races we have this summer. So thank you. Thank you.